Hi, this is Kevin Kramer, CTO at Sapio. And I put together a very brief um, overview on our thinking around AI and its impact that we're going to see on life sciences. We get a lot of questions around this. I think a lot of people are underestimating what's going to happen. But th this does have an impact on your planning and systems uh, that you start thinking about um, in your ecosystem. And you know, anytime you're making predictions about the future, there's always the risk that you're wrong. But I, I put my confidence level reasonably high on the predictions we're going to outline today. All right. So first, just to understand what AI has done to industry in general, even outside of life sciences. Um, the experts, you know, if you went back 20 or 30 years, experts said, oh, it's the manual laborers who are going to be displaced or disrupted with, uh, with machine learning, artificial intelligence or robotics, what have you. But it, it really turns out that's actually not true at all. It's the, the knowledge workers who are being disrupted. You know, people use their brain versus their brawn. It, you know, it turns out to be a lot harder to do physical work with robots, et cetera, uh, with the precision that's needed. But to replicate what humans do when we think and have knowledge about things, it turns out to be much more straightforward uh, than, than the other. So that's actually what's getting disrupted right now. And there's already a lot of examples of this. I, I say writers generically, but there's all kinds of writers, right? Blog writers, marketing writers, press release writers, book writers, et cetera. Also artists. Now I can, you know, just put a prompt in and get an image. Uh, you can even get video now, uh, short videos. And soon you'll be able to basically describe a movie and it'll create the whole movie for you, including the script. Bloggers, marketers, music is being written by AI. And I suspect in the future, most of the music will be written by AI not by humans. Uh, medical doctors, they, they've done studies on this. The people who use the systems find them better, more empathetic, more informative than doctors. And it kind of makes sense. I mean, AI is uber patient and it it's consumed basically all the knowledge of medicine that is available publicly. And some of these models are fine-tuned even to, to know even more uh, and be disciplined around the, uh, the, the medical profession. So they're already being displaced, and that's great. We definitely need that because we don't have enough doctors. Um, lawyers, law, law, legal research, uh, contract review is, is uh, being done a lot by AI now. Programmers, you know, our programmers at SAPIO are way more productive now thanks to AI, and that's just going to continue, uh, you know, and be more and more over the coming years. So we'd be we'd be naive to think that life sciences isn't going to be similarly impacted, and that it will be the knowledge workers who are going to be impacted uh, and disrupted or enhanced, uh, depending how you want to think about it. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So this is going to be the next next tier of disruption. I think that the you know doing what a molecular biologist does or a medicinal chemist does is is trickier than some of these other things where you just had to kind of memorize in a language model you know, legal, legal ease and legal contracts. Um, you need a certain level of reasoning. You need a certain understanding of molecular biology, chemistry, physics, et cetera. But now that's already happened. And the newer models now are already quite good. They're at PhD level or better in understanding these uh, different disciplines that are important for life sciences. And they're starting to be able to reason. And when you tie this in with tools, and Sapio has done this with our tool of tools. When you really start to understand what this means, uh, combining that with an LLM that can reason, this is going to be a huge disruption um, in life sciences, for sure. There's no question. And this is not, I'm not talking five years out. I'm not even talking two years out. I'm talking basically now, in the next six to 12 months, you're going to see radically different things, I think, that will have people rethinking where they're putting their emphasis um, in terms of the R&D uh, pipeline. So basically, you have less people who can do more. And the other interesting side effect of this is that if someone's less capable, a less good researcher, uh, they're actually going to be better. They're going to be enhanced, if you will, by AI to be more like an expert uh, than they might have been otherwise. And the experts will even be more productive as well. So it'll help everybody. It'll kind of be a levels, you know, 
leveling effect across uh, the workforce. But again, you'll need less people. And I think as in many other professions, um, the the experts, the people who really understand the job will become more like conductors. They aren't going to be, uh, you know, necessarily up doing the grunt work. The AI will do that for them. And they're directing traffic and they're reviewing and then they're making another request. But the AI will do all the heavy lifting. So it's just going to make them super efficient, much faster at what they do. And they'll get to results quicker. Uh, and the results will be more meaningful, more viable. So this is all good uh, in terms of accelerating drug discovery. And, you know, I'm excited to see, you know, this, this come to be here in the very near future. All right, so let's talk about life sciences specifically. Um, these are very large categories I'm going to talk about here. So don't, you know, I know we didn't get down into the nuance of each category of, of life sciences, but we're going to start with thinking about R&D as a pipeline. And in terms of systems, so we're talking about uh, information systems that support these, these uh, categories of functions within organizations. Generally, when you're in the heavy research end of the you know, pipeline, um, it's, it's very electronic laboratory notebook heavy. And that makes sense if you think about it. You're doing a lot of exploratory, exploratory work, so you're doing experiments, right? You're experimenting uh, a lot to try to you know, find candidates that you want to take forward. So it's very heavy on the ELN. Uh, front, which makes sense. And it's it's less so on the LIMS, Laboratory Information Management System. But as you get down the pipeline, you're going to do more LIMS because you're going to do more bench work. There'll be a lot more hands-on things being done. Um, if you're scaling up something, for example, um, on a large molecule or synthesizing things, assaying things, there's there's more work here. It's not like LIMS is absent here and ELN is absent here. But in terms of waiting, it's a lot more ELN on this side and a lot more LIMS the further down the, the pipeline you get. Now, when you have candidates and you take them into the clinical study phase, now you're getting the clinical trial management systems, e-clinical functions, clinical data management systems. These are all super important in understanding and organizing uh, and planning your, your clinical study, uh, patient recruitment, uh, all the metrics and measurements that are gonna be done. This is super important to getting a trial underway and assessing the effectiveness of the trial uh, as quickly as you can. Once you actually get to market and uh, you start thinking about, you know, you've already thought about it. Of course, you've done manufacturing even back in the development stage, but now you're actually manufacturing drugs that are going to be sold to consumers. So here you care about environmental monitoring, stability, testing, QC, QCing your batches and, and tracking electronic batch records, all super important functions that um, you need to have really uh, when you're taking a drug and uh, selling it. So what's AI's impact on, on this entire process going to be? Well, I think, and maybe people will be shocked to think about this or hear this, but I think the ELN market is largely going to be subsumed by AI. A lot of the exploratory work is now going to be done by AI and it will be super efficient, super effective, and super fast at um, working with targets and candidates and getting to something with a lot less exper you know, experimental work needing to be done. It'll be done in, in silico. And therefore, ELNs, they aren't going to go away. But I could certainly conceive where in the past you had a 1,000 users or on an ELN. Now you have 50 or 100. And the other 900 are really being done by AI. It's doing the heavy lifting for you. So they're not going to go away, but I think that's why I say largely subsumed. Maybe someday it'll totally be subsumed, probably will. But I think in the near term, uh, near to medium term, I think ELNs will become just less significant in terms of having such broad coverage across the scientists because I just, they can do more important things because the, the AI agent is going to be doing a lot of the work really for them. I think there'll be more limited impact on limbs. And that's because now we're getting again to the brains versus brawn question. And now you're getting to the bench work. You know, you need to track that. You have to get on the bench and work. And I think it's a longer time until we have robots that have the precision to do the work of a lab scientist. Um, so I think for the foreseeable future, limbs will still be a critical part 
of the process and needed um, in the R&D function. I also think this area is not going to be replaced by AI either. You still need to consume data from many systems um, and AI will aid in things like patient recruitment, you know, analyzing data that you're getting, but you still need a way to aggregate that data into a single system to look at, to assess how trials uh, proceeding and also even in the planning stage uh, for your clinical, clinical studies. And here, when you're actually manufacturing the drug, again, systems are going to be critical. I don't see this changing anytime soon. So I think that these three areas are going to continue to have systems needed, just as important as they are today. AI will supplement. Um, at Sapio, we're using AI to help the usability of these systems, to make it easier and more rapid to build out uh, workflows, to make the user experience using the system more straightforward, um, using natural language, for example. Um, so it will have an impact in that sense, but in terms of needing a system, I think in these cases, it's also going to be applicable for the next five to 10 years, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, notwithstanding any developments that I, I can't anticipate. But I think here's where there's going to be the biggest impact of AI, is to speed up this part of the process. And we're doing what we can to make it that maybe ELNs become irrelevant. So we have our tool of tools, which is in the lab, and we're looking forward to releasing that early next year. And I think you're going to see some really cool stuff coming out of that. But it's not just us. There's dozens of places working on either open source or commercial tools that are uh, making it easier to design, test, and assess molecules completely in silico. So we want to make access to those tools straightforward. We want to be the Uber kind of integration tool on the ELN side so that we can work with those tools as needed to help get to, you know, a discovery quicker. And we're excited to, you know, see this feature play out and do what we can to support the science and the scientists. And I think that's the best that we can do is to help them uh, do their job better, faster, and smarter. And AI, AI is going to be kind of the Uber assistant to them uh, in doing their job. So look forward to open discussion on this um, and other viewpoints on it. Certainly it's it's ours at Sapio, but um, there's a lot of moving parts here. So it's a, it's certainly an intriguing discussion to have and think about where we're headed uh, over the next few years. Thank you.